Welcome everyone to our first DIFF live event. The Diversity and Inclusivity Finance Forum was launched by Mortgage Solutions for the mortgage industry as a whole in 2020. It evolved from the Women in Finance Forum, which had existed in some form since 2011. DIFF is a member-based initiative with over 70 companies from every sector of the intermediated mortgage industry supporting it. Big, medium and small, lenders, distributors, surveyors, conveyancers, and tech companies engage with our guiding principles to create a fairer environment for all. We work with all the trade bodies and indeed are the main sponsor of Amy's mentoring diversity and include mentoring initiative, sorry, to help people progress through their careers. We all know diversity and inclusivity is important but it is especially so in times of uncertainty and change. The market, and thus our customers, are experiencing volatility. Volatility in house prices, volatility in mortgage rates, and volatility in affordability. And all this against a backdrop of a persistent cost of living challenge. Today, we are joined by an outstanding panel of industry leaders who are going to tell us both their personal and their company successes in matters d &I, and discuss where we need to go from here. Joining me is Richard Fearon, Chief Executive Officer of Leeds Building Society, Esther Dextra, Managing Director, Intermediaries at Lloyds Banking Group, Dina Budia, Chief Executive Officer at P2M Group, a boutique DA advisor, and last but definitely never least, Ali Crosley, Managing Director, Distribution at Legal and General. Right, guys, um, have you and your company achieved in terms of DNI over the last few years? Uh, let's kick off with you, Richard. Thank you, Barrett, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm, as I say, Richard Freon, Chief Exec at Leeds. I've been Chief Exec since 2019. Uh, and I thought, so Barrett suggested I tell a few stories, really, try and bring the experience to life. Um, of what that, that period has been like. And I suppose that if I think about the thing that encapsulates the beginning of this journey for us back in 2019, we do lots of colleague roadshows, we call them face to face with um, sort of 1500 odd colleagues around the country. And I remember getting a question in one of those roadshows, which was, um, why are there more white men called Andy on the executive committee than there are women? And I'm like, wow. You know, that is, that feels really difficult, really awkward. We were on the back foot. Um, you know, so sort of ironically, actually, we have had won awards for inclusive, inclusion, d and um, But as Barrett knows better than anyone, there are awards and there are awards. So, you know, there are real awards and there are sort of plastic ones. Um, and I think, you know, another fact at that time, and this is close to a number of people's hearts here, we had, if I look at our board, our executive directors, our chief officers on the exec team and the directors on the management committee, we had precisely 0% people from an ethnic minority in that population. So you can win the award, but it's not the lived experience of people by any means. It's, um, you know, it's meaningless. So uh, where are we today? Um, it's very different. It's very different. Um, colleagues tell us that it feels different, that it feels inclusive and diverse. Um, when we ran our survey last year, our engagement survey, it was actually the top scoring question of any of our questions in terms of feeling like an inclusive and diverse environment. Um, and recently we got accredited by um, as a gold inclusive employer, which um, our team were, were very, very proud of. I gather so only 4% of companies that have gone through the accreditation process ended up as gold. And we, we turned out to be the, the joint first private sector company that got a gold accreditation. And the good thing about this accreditation was they came in and spoke to the forums, the colleagues involved. It wasn't one of those submissions where you try and write the best submission ever, which was the, the sort of thing that used to happen. Um, and there are probably two other examples I'd give of, of where we're at. So. That number I mentioned earlier about the board and the senior, the most senior team has moved from 0% uh, ethnic minority background to actually 15% in that period. So we have 
changed, you know, that's one indicator. There are lots of others I'll come on to later. We've changed things. But um, I thought I'd actually read out a quote from one of our colleagues. This is from a different award that they went to, which was Northeast Contact Centre of the Year. Um, and actually, we, we won an award, which is the, the most people centric uh, company. Uh, but when the colleagues got up on stage, so one of our colleagues who uh, is neurodiverse spoke to the host and cried on stage, telling him that Leeds Building Society made him feel like a real person, had given him a life, made him belong more than he ever had before. And for me, that is actually the measure of you know, how do people really feel? Um, so two other points I was going to cover very briefly. One is why do you do this? Why? Uh, and there's loads and loads of stats around innovation and productivity and your customer base. But frankly, for me, it boils down to it is the right thing to do. And you never quite know where it's going to make a difference. Um, and I was talking at, at, in December to Barrett about particular interaction with one of our non-exec directors. Um, is a, a lady who's actually she's Iranian by background. She's actually w was a refugee. She's now um, a director on our board, lots of digital skills. Uh, and I remember when um, the Ukraine invasion happened, talking to her about some of the support we were providing and donations and so on. And I remember her saying, well, do you know what I think people would really value is somewhere safe to live? And that was actually the genesis of a whole stream of work we did in redeveloping some of our branches to host Ukrainian refugees families in, in Peterborough. So, so, you know, that would never have happened if we didn't have that diversity on the board. Um, and then I'm conscious of, of time. So I'm just going to, um, I've got a long list here, which I'm not going to read out to people of what did we do to get there? But fundamentally, the bits I've circled as I think most important on this is I was fortunate when I started, I had an enlightened chair that also started around the same time. And frankly, it, it was a focus and a priority for himself, myself, my deputy CEO, who's a, the sponsor of, of, of all of our work. And that, that, that's the key. You know, it became a real focus. So everything else that flows from that, whether it's budget, whether it's full time people have done an amazing job on this rather than the side of desk, whether it's how you go on the targets journey, the strategy, the narrative, the training that we've done, the link to our purpose, all of that, you know, getting involved at events. I mean, it's great fun to be involved with that, but it all comes down to is it actually a priority from the very top of the organization and so on. And, you know, as I say, I've been very fortunate in, in the chairman being a big part of that and a huge advocate of this agenda. So hopefully that gives you a little flavor of our journey. Uh, and I'll stop now, Barb, so you can hand over to one of the others. Thank you. No, thank you very much. That does sound like you've done something and, and it's not just talk. There's some real improvement and, um, uh, and, and a very personal sort of benefit immediately to you. Um, Esther, um, I know Lloyd's have done lots of stuff, but do you want to run us through what, it's, what, what you've done and what it's meant to you? Thank you. Yes, good afternoon as well. And uh, I think at Lloyd's Banking Group, we've been really bold and ambitious to say we want to be leading in terms of diversity, equity and inclusion. And therefore, we have stretched uh, ourselves to publicly committed targets um, around um, senior female representation, um, black, Asian and minority ethnic representation, as well as um, disability uh, colleagues. And um, what have we done to achieve those targets? Um, we've done things like, you know, we were leading in a returners programme, um, so people from maternity or paternity leave. Uh, we've done lots of sports around menopause. We've done race education for all our colleagues. And when you think of the number of people, that's about 70,000 people. So that will also have like ripple effects in, in terms of, you know, in communities. Um, and not just, it's not just about those targets and the programs to, to help those targets, but also uh, a huge focus on mental health and well-being by training on advocates who can support colleagues to get the right support when they need it. Because we all know that it's um, you can focus on getting people on board, but you also need to make sure that they then feel uh, you know they can they can work in the workplace, etc. And we have extended that through the um, cost of living crisis uh, with financial well-being programs as well. Um, 
And like I said, we have extended our public commitments by also having representation for people with disabilities to double that by 2025. And we did appoint um, a group board member who is blind um, to sort of really signal, like Richard said, you have to have commitment from the top to, to show that you're actually doing it. We, we know that recruitment is sort of a gateway to get people on board, so we've done a lot of um, inclusive hiring training to make sure that people really focus on how do you access the broadest pool of people to attract that talent. Um, and as a consequence, we've already significantly increased, uh, you know, female representation, black, uh, Asian and ethnic minority colleagues uh, representation. Um, just to, to, to grow that. And I think what we're, like Richard, we've won awards as well, but I think that's great because there are lots of uh, organisations who do recognise and properly vet if you are achieving the results you set out to do. And I do think that keeps you honest. And what I'm really pleased to see is that we've started to focus more on equity, so about fairness. Um, because I think that makes sure that every colleague is brought into the process, so it's not just a focus on the target, but also a focus on, you know, everybody should feel that they're part of that, of, of it, of the company, and that they can bring themselves. And simple example of how that practically works out is, we've taken away our requirement for the graduate scheme to have a 2-1 score, because not everybody has equal access to education, so therefore it, it makes that whole journey fair. Um, so, and that's something we will build on, because like I said, we've had targets in the past, but we will also now continue to stretch those. Thank, thank you, Esther, that's, that, is, that is fantastic, because I do think context is important. Uh, and, um, you know, if you've been to the right school and you have private tutors and stuff, a 2-1, um, is, is a relatively simple thing, whereas a 2-2, if you've had to also work at night and not have access to a computer, is, is, is a completely different beast. Um, Ali, you've done some amazing things. Can you tell us what the LNG and your activity has been over the last few years? Yes, thank you, Barrett, and good afternoon, everyone. It's really good to hear Esther and, and Richard just talking about the various initiatives, and, and there's, there's so many synergies in our organisations, actually, and that's I think one of the great things, Barrett, that you've done in, in DIFF, that we've all come together and shared so much of this best practice, and you mentioned the menopause policy from LNG, and, and I think that's just great, because we, we're all kind of learning how to be better and we'll have great intent here, but we can never do enough. I think to answer your question in LNG, I mean, the simple answer is there's massive momentum behind DNI and LNG. Um, I think in the last five years, so I've been exec sponsor for the last five years um, uh, for the retail business, uh, which makes up about half of the UK businesses. And in those last five years, we've set up a group, Steerco, um, where we've agreed across across the group um, what the priorities are for for DNI and what the targets might be, and to share best practice and that kind of thing. And then at a local level in the retail business, my area. Um, we've been very focused on some specific areas. I think one of the things that I'm sure we've all found is that you just can't do everything. Um, there are so many different aspects to DNI. It, you you have to decide where to focus, and that's certainly been the the approach that we've taken at LNG. And we focused in a number of areas. And in the D space, so diversity, obviously we set lots of targets, and perhaps we'll talk about that. The things that we need to do to improve representation. But in the I space, the inclusion piece, that's the bit where I personally have always been um, really impassioned because I think it's about ensuring that everybody feels very welcome in the room, everybody feels that they can speak up, everybody can look around the room and see themselves represented. That's the, sort of the, the ultimate goal. And we've done things like um, introduce a reverse mentoring programme which actually I introduced about three years ago now into LNG. Um, it's been rolled out across the group. Hundreds of people have gone through that reverse mentoring programme, and I'm sure that both Richard and Esther have got similar schemes. Lots of these sorts of schemes run now um, in our organisations. And it's basically about 
putting yourself in the shoes of somebody else and living somebody else's experience. Obviously, I can talk about what it's like to be a white woman in a very male-dominated insurance industry. I can't talk about what it's like to be a white woman of colour with a neurodiverse um, challenge as well in that in that in that industry. So. Um, and that brings with it even more layers of complexity and challenge than it might do for me just just being a woman in that in, in that context. So um, the reverse mentoring program, particularly for neurodiverse um, um, diverse people, has been incredibly uh, impactful. And it was interesting to hear Richard talking about um, the neurodiverse person that stood on the stage and, and, and was in tears. We had a very, very similar similar um, experience. Actually, our, our CEO was mentored by um, a neurodiverse lady who started out incredibly, she was incredibly nervous at the beginning of the program, didn't particularly want to be um, um, paired with our CEO, was terrified by the whole process. By the end of six months and going through um, the program with him, they both had an incredibly raised level of awareness and she was so empowered. It actually is putting goosebumps on me remembering her story because I feel like we changed her life. In fact, she said that exactly, Richard, as you said. We, we, we're just giving a platform um, to help so many people feel included and valued. Um, really what it's all about. We've done a huge amount too on the whole recruitment process, things like blind CVs, things like um, um, training for uh, people in, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, when you're, when you're, when you've got some, my, my words are going, see I've got, men, I'm going through the menopause, I've got brain fog. Barrett. We can talk about that. That's fine. Um, yeah. So, so, so when you when you discriminate, <laughs> when yeah. you discriminate on, against people Biases. on their name, yeah. So we've done we've done lots of training on that, and we've done things like you know accepting people through the recruitment and through the shortlist, where they may only be seventy percent ticking all of the capability and skills boxes, but we can see that culturally and attitudinally they're going to be a really good fit for LNG. So we've changed our approach to shortlists. I mean, in a very similar way to LBG by the sounds of things, which has been really impactful. And then I think the last thing we've done, which I'd share with people, is a huge amount of work on a narrative stories, people sharing their stories. So people like the neurodiverse person I, I spoke of, but others too, lots and lots of different people who've been prepared to come forward and talk about their own lived experience, either in or within or without the organisation. But that, that's been incredibly impactful too and made people feel like they matter and they do. So lots and lots of things there. Last thing I'd say, Barrett, I'm sure I'm going over my time too, is, I, and I know that Esther is this and, and, and Richard too, I think it's incredibly important for senior leaders to be an ally. I mean, that's, the, that's a, a just massively important. We have a responsibility to ensure that everybody in the room is, is feeling comfortable about speaking up, for calling out things that we can see that are clearly nonsense and discriminatory. And so being that, um, very proactive, visible and vocal ally is very important. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know, and, and as one of the uh, people that's regularly thanked on virtually every DNI podcast I do, Ali, your, your work is recognised everywhere. Um, Dina, yeah. let's come to you. Let's make this all real and non-corporate. So tell us about your DNI journey and, and you know, what's, what's been happening to you and what you've seen happen in the industry from your perspective. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me here today, Barrett. Um, my DNI journey. So um, I was, I suppose, sponsored, is, it seems to be a corporate term being used quite a bit um, in this journey, um, to, to be part of uh, this diversity and investment finance forum. And for me, it's something that in the last 20 years of my career, I have felt it, I have fought it, and actually, I suppose sat back because I just thought it was, I, just, I can't do any more, I, I can't change the world, I can't change the people around me. Um, and, and you start getting tired, Barrett, you start getting quite like, this is it, this is it for me, you know, this is the way it's going to be, and you, you and it's acceptance, you end up sitting back and you just accept. Um, but the first day I actually came to one of the actual um, events, uh, Barrett, Honestly, it was horrific for me. 
I walked into what was a building that I would have never, ever dreamt to be in. It was grand. It was colonial. It was it was too posh for Dina to even even walk to, walk into, you know, let alone getting the train into London. That's, you know, for many, that's that's just not even in the radar. So I walked into this room and there was, all, and I knew there was going to be a lot of sort of managing directors and CEOs of, um, you know, different banks. And um, for me, just to see my little logo, actually, Barrett was like, oh my God, I'm, 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 my, my logo's next to Lloyd's Banking Group. And oh my God, you know, that was, that was the pivotal moment just to see that. And I took a photo and I've still got it just to take back to my team. Um, but going into the room, it was, um, it was not nice. It was not nice because you walk in and you think, and I did, where's another brown face? And yes, I had Barrett and his turban and in front of me, the big giant tall man and I'm a little short legs. And I'm thinking, where is he? Where is he? And and he actually, you know, to be fair, Barrett, you did you did come over to say hello um, and, and sort of welcome me. Um, but at the end of it, it was, it was up to me. It was up to me to now break into this world that I never had. But I couldn't. I couldn't. I, I didn't move beyond that sort of entrance door. And I thought, five minutes, 10 minutes, nobody's come to say hello. I'm not quite sure I want to be here. And I was ready to turn back. I was ready to turn back until one of the ladies, actually, um, from, I'm going to mention her, Paragon, um, Christine Yule, she came over, she reached out. And, and I, I was so emotional that I, I was going to break. And I, I I just said it the way it was. I said, I, I can't do this. I've got to go. Um, you know, I, I don't know what this is about. I'm here because I just thought, oh, why not? And, um, but I don't know why I'm here. I, I honestly didn't. Being being um, an SME, a small business, I wasn't getting paid to come. I was, I was going out of my own just because it was something that I believe in and I thought I'm spending my whole day this could cost me a lot of money in my business and what am I doing here I do not know but I persevered I persevered I saw I sat I listened and I thought whoa this is this is this is interesting stuff this really is and I've got to be part of this um but I wasn't ready to speak a few years on now fast forward now where am I now um, I have told my story a few times, um, you know, as Ali and uh, Esther says, you know, being an Asian woman, um, not with no degree background, you know, leaving the corporate world because it just, I didn't fit in. I didn't fit in. There was no space for me 20 years ago. I was at the peak of my career. I had no choice but to leave. On top of that, being a mum. So there's, there's layer upon layer upon layer. And as you said, when you've got, um, Annie mentioned, you know, when you've got, you know, being a woman or a white woman um, in a, you know, middle class white environment, um, finance, property is all about men. It's, you know, majority is men. It just gets tougher and tougher. And then I set up my own business, setting up my own business. I, I, um, I just thought, Okay, right, I'm a bit comfortable, but you're fighting fire every moment as a business owner, let alone all these other challenges, you're fighting fire. And then coming from a, an Asian background, it's it's very different. As, as you all talked about culture, you know, it, it, it's about understanding the culture and the faith and the beliefs of in, individuals. Each human comes from complete different backgrounds. And not even feeling inclusive in my own world, because women don't do businesses, you know, Asian women 20 years ago, you know, what? You should be sitting at home having children, making chapatis in my world. And it's, it's up to my husband to, to, to bring the money in, you know, and I'm sure that's this resonates with many of you out there. But I, I didn't have anyone who really, I suppose, sponsored me, mentored me, gave me that, that support. I said, no, you can do this. But what I did have was a generation. I wanted to make a difference to, you know, what my daughter saw when she grew up. And, and I suppose I can't measure or monetize. I think we're going to talk about this in a, in, in a bit, Barrett. But for me, it was about making a difference. And if that meant me putting my story out there, 
I broke that. And, you know, we, we talked about role models, I think, in one of the events, Barrett. And, and I, I hope I'm not digressing, actually. Am I? Oh, you're all right for a while. Yeah, go all on. Right. Okay. We talked about role models. And, um, you know, I've always asked around, you know, now I've got to know people at the, at the forum and, and made, made some amazing friends, actually. Um, I'm always on search. I'm like, hey, do you know anybody else who's like from my background and Asian woman and, and trying to build a bit of a consortium, reaching out on LinkedIn to people in the industry who, who may look like me, feel like me, possibly can share their story and maybe to be a mentor. I'm struggling. I was struggling and struggling. And, and you know, people across the corporate world, I was like, do, do, you, do you know? And everyone was like, no, no. And then there was an event where we had some statistics thrown at us. Um, and that was shocking, you know, it really was shocking. I was I was hoping that the statistics were to do with ethnic minority women in senior leadership level. And I was being optimistic. I thought it would sit around 3%. I thought, you know, let, let's go for this. I know it's low, but 3%, I, I'll give it that. But actually, the statistic was 1%. And a few of you, I, I know that, again, Christine, because I broke, I, I actually cried in that event and many people saw my tears because I just, you know, when you see it, visually see a figure put on you and you're part of that figure, it's, it's, it's not nice. So, and that's now. So I'm actually thinking, wow, 20 years ago, I'm 20 years on, nothing's changed, Barrett, nothing's changed. Yeah. But we're talking about it, you know, the corporates are taking action. They are, they are, it's the belief. I, I genuinely think the belief is igniting. People are seeing, people are voicing. And if, if that's where we are, then that's great. But we've still got a long way to go. Um, yeah, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get to that. Thank, thank you for that, Dina. And I think um, you're, you know, the fact that, you're now very vocal and are seen and people search you out. I know lenders search you out to come and talk to our teams and stuff. And I think the only way we can really influence it, uh, you know, you, you are the role model for uh, South Asian female business success and you should be very proud of that. Um, and as you touched on measurement, um, let, let, let's get on to measurement um, because, you know, Dina's story is a very personal, real story, but in a corporate world, you, you have all these phrases of what can be measured can be done uh, and people sort of need proof and, and all this sort of stuff. So what is your view, uh, Ali, on measurement? How does LNG do it and, 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 and how important do you think it is? Um, before I answer that question, Barrett, can I just say, Dina, I think you're an absolute legend and you have just beautifully illustrated why people sharing their own stories is incredibly powerful. I know Richard Nestle would completely agree with me. I mean, it's that, this is why this is, stuff is just so important. Um, targets matter, absolutely. We do set targets um, at LNG, both at group level and at regional level. Um, we share those targets, we publish those targets. I guess, you know, what gets measured gets done, basically. Um, and I think sharing those targets is really important because it shows our commitment to our people that we're serious about, about this stuff, for, for one. Um, and um, the reason we're serious about this, and Richard covered this, it, it, it matters. You know, it matters from a moral perspective. But also, of course, I think it's really important to demonstrate through the data that diverse businesses are higher performing businesses. And there's a loads and loads of data on that. And we intend to keep demonstrating that, you know, diversity of thought is a, is a very helpful and positive thing for an organization. So, um, yes, we, we, we're, we're very transparent about our measures. We absolutely will continue to measure. Um, in fact, we go further than we're required to do from a regulatory perspective and in our annual report and accounts, we publish not just things like gender um, targets, pay gap and so on, but also now ethnicity target, um, which is very challenging. And we are, we've, we've got a higher um, target than any of our insurance peers. Um, and, um, you know, we can see it's not, not necessarily going to be an easy target to hit, particularly when turnover of staff has been much lower in the last 12 months as we go through cost of living crisis, fewer people have actually moved jobs. So it makes it more difficult to achieve some of these um, targets when you're not recruiting externally as fast as you were before. 
Um, but yeah, in summary, Barrett, I think it really matters. I think it's about not having loads and loads of targets back to that focus point, um, but, but just focusing on the targets that, that, that seem really important. So gender, ethnicity, um, pay gap, very, very important for us at LNG. Esther, do you, what kind of targets do you do and do your targets evolve? Yeah, and just to, to, to build on Alex's point of why targets, I think when you are a business owner, no matter if you are in a big corporate or a small one, you measure things that are important, you know, if it's profits or revenue or, you know, whatever your measurement of success for your business is, people are always a key, you know, measurement of success for any business. And therefore, I think it's really key that you set targets around that as well, because that keeps you honest. And like Dina said, you know, because otherwise you can do a lot of nice programs but if actually the results are not there, you know, that, that's why it's so important to set those targets. So as I said, we've, we've got uh, publicly uh, published measurements around all of those, including disability, so gender, black, Asian and minority ethnic representation, all that senior roles, and then um, disability as well, because I think that's really important to recognise as well. And I think it's, you know, and that will drive focus, that will drive change, because if you want to achieve those targets, that's what you do, the same as you would do with, you know, any other targets that you set to achieve. But I don't think that alone is enough, because you do need to, to really make sure people understand why, colleagues understand why in your business, so that you don't get, the, it, it sort of, um, you know, that you bring one group to the forefront because you've set the target for that, but that progression is for everybody and that it is uh, fair, etc. And I think you just then have to look at the whole life cycle of colleagues as well. So it's not just, you know, because setting the targets in terms of then almost focuses on recruitment to get the right mix, but you have to make sure you then create a inclusive environment so that colleagues want to stay and you know that it becomes part of your everyday business. Um, so I think there's still yeah more to do there, but I would say that that those are important aspects of setting targets. And Richard, do you have a, a view on, on target and measurement? Yeah, um, I think probably three points. I mean, we we did set targets at the start of our journey, and. Um, I think what I like to think is that as we've made more progress, they've slightly faded into the background and things like stories and, you know, Dina's was incredibly powerful. Lis listening to people share their stories has sort of taken front and centre. Uh, we actually, I mean, we actually call it IND, so inclusion and diversity here in terms of the way around we talk about it. I think that one of the difficulties with targets at the outset, you know, we we, only, we have data on gender and ethnicity and we set targets around that. But then you've got, you know, neurodiversity, social mobility, caring responsibilities, disability. So you could end up with lots and lots. So I think they are really important, but we're hoping that they just fade behind because we're making progress. And there's two points I want to make on targets which are really important. One is you've got, if you've got them, you've got to get there in the right way. So when you're recruiting, I think, you know, as, as an example, we were after a new uh, board audit chair and we had, you know, lists and lists of applicants that were all white and male, right? And that is, you know, clearly not good enough. So we worked harder and harder. And it took us 18 months in the end to get a diverse list of candidates. And then you pick the best person for the job, whoever that was well, across the whole list. But the point was it took a lot of effort to make sure we had a good list as it happens, the lady that was appointed, who's uh, Indian heritage as well, is brilliant. And she brings something different to the board. But it, it was about getting the best person for the job and working on that. And then the second thing I would just say, we do get some pushback. They can be a bit divisive um, initially. I think that's disappeared here. But um, I, I was reverse mentored um, by someone for a, a, um, from a very different background over the last year or two. And something stuck in my mind. It's the stories that stick in your mind from that. You know, I, I, I went out a couple of weeks ago in, in the Lake District. And I went out and I was wearing a flowery shirt and I sort of ended up in a pub and I went upstairs and someone said something not very nice to me on the way up the stairs, you know, effing 
nasty word that rhymes with maggot. Uh, and you sort of, you kind of brush it off, right? Because that happens to me once in a blue moon or you, you brush it off. And you, But if someone was to say something like that to you all the time, and we use an example about mosquito bites, you get bitten once, it's fine. So if that happened all the time, you'd become, you'd become a different person. And the chap that was reverse mentoring me, is bit, he's my age, mid-40s, been out in Leeds since he was 18, goes out every week. He's not been out once in his entire life without someone saying something to him about the color of his skin, something discriminatory and abusive. That is just, so we do have to make a difference here. We have to do something, face into that you know, reaction and explain why it's important. You know, put yourself in people's shoes, understand their stories and then do something about it. It does, and it, it does happen. And uh, I noticed it happens less in Surrey than it does in East London, but there you go. Um, Dina, what, what's your view on measurements? Do you think they're important from your perspective, uh, and do you think they work? I think in in my small sort of business world, measuring this, this sort of conversation is, is very difficult, but I have to take ownership of the wider, the wider global world and what's going on out there. And that means I've got to take action. I think we all have a responsibility as humans, doesn't matter which background we are, that we need to accept those around us. And that means everything that goes with them. Um, and we will only understand what is everything that goes with them if we get to know them and actually empower them to tell that story, which is what everybody is saying here today. And I suppose that is my measurement for me. The more people, whether it be me saying my story empowers somebody else, somebody else, somebody else, that is my role here, I, I, I feel. that, And I don't know whether my story is making, because who is measuring it? It's only when I get told. And, and because, and, and all those that are telling me are all from external corporate businesses. So I, I only get told, I mean, I was at the last IF event actually, and um, a gentleman from NatWest, actually, Barrett, where I spoke on NatWest, he said, oh, um, oh, I remember your name, blah, blah, blah. I said, oh, great, okay. Um, and I thought, actually, I think you, you ignited that conversation, Barrett. And, um, he said, oh, yeah, do you know what what change you actually made? I said, what's that? Because I don't hear that. Just because of me being on that podcast, I thought I was just reeling off my story because to me it's just what I've lived and I'm just telling you, like I would tell my daughter or anybody else. Um, and, and that gentleman actually said that he's um, he's got a BDM um, from a South Asian woman background and there's something about her that keeps apologising all the time, like, Oh, I, I, you know, I've got this idea, but I'm really sorry. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry if this is okay. And I, I, I heard myself because that's pretty much how I tend to present myself. I know what I'm talking about, but I tend to apologise for it, or I tend to doubt that. Oh, I don't know if that's what everybody else is seeing. And from her hearing my story, um, this gentleman actually said he understood how to manage her and empower her and actually push her forward and bring her in inclusively because he actually sort of saw very similar sort of traits in our characters. Um, so there is a difference in different cultures and different races and different, you know, um, ethnicities and different walks of life. And I think that's how I measure it. When I see at senior level i see places i go to in our industry over the years we've evolved there's been so many more women i can see that you can you can believe it it's fantastic to see and i think it's about now edging edging the narrative a little bit more forward in in what we're discussing today thank you Dina. Uh, just quickly because we've got some uh questions um just a minute on new initiatives and where do you want to go and where should we be going um esther yeah, I think for me, um, we've mentioned it before, it's really important to continue to focus because you have lots of competing priorities in the business. So definitely, and I think DIV really helps with that because it, you know, when you go there, you are thinking about it and you're prioritizing it. So it's a very good to have that in the calendar and long may that continue. Um, I think for us, it's also about, um, disabilities and getting more disclosure on that because that's quite difficult uh people still don't trust 
you know, to disclose that or talk about that. And we want to support everybody, like Dina said, to understand everybody's story. And I think continue being bold. Um, I call it sort of potential overpolish because it's easy to continue to recruit people who tick 100% all the boxes. But I think sometimes, yeah, being bold and going for the potential is, is where to go. Um, Dina, where do you think one a minute on where do you think the next thing should be? I mean, on a on my perspective, I, I think you know the wider audience that feed the corporate on an intermediary perspective is actually the broker world. I think there's you know th th there's a large cohort that is not captured, um, which are the self-employed smaller business owners. Um, so I would like really like to see more people from that background coming into the the conversation and actively talking about it and actually coming to these forums. Um, yes. my Thank you. Um, uh, Richard? Uh, probably just two quick points. One, um, I was just alerted that there was, a, there was a report end of last year from Financial Services Skills Commission. One of the things it highlighted was the number of women in the financial sector have dropped from uh, from 51% to 43%. So actually, as a sector, we all need to make this an attractive sector um, to attract diverse talent. Um, and that's, you know, for example, things like DIFF has been mentioned a few times, and I know our very own fabulous Martez Carton has been part of that. It is really important that we as a sector kind of lead the way and attract that talent into the whole sector. And then the other point I would just say is um, about pipelines, because obviously this building pipelines whether that be at apprentice graduate level pipelines all the way through the business to help progress and focus and you know so one of the one of the initiatives that's been very successful for us we've built something called the non-executive director network the leads ned network so this is aspiring board members um and it's a very sort of diverse group of people and helping you know i go the chair goes lots of our neds go and talk about all sorts of things all discussions to help them get ready to join boards of their own in the coming years. And, you know, my hope is that they, that then is beneficial for other firms. Who knows, we might recruit from that pool, but others might do too. So just pipelines all the way through. Ali, next step, your, what, what would um, you most like to yeah, do? I think I summarise it. It's, it's not a huge amount of change, Barrett. It's more about embedding, kind of evolving, listening to the feedback that we've been getting on our voice scores in some areas, particularly around speaking up for some groups that still feel less able to speak up. So uh, there's still so much to do in the areas that we've already focused on, particularly around the ethnicity targets. So I think it's just more of the same. And the final thing is really about being much smarter about using our collective muscle, both in, in, within the group, because it's a massive group. There's lots of different um, DNI type groups. So bringing all of those together and harnessing that that um, that muscle, as I say, I think is is going to be really important. And I'd say also that across the industry, so the more this kind of stuff we do through DIFF and other forums is is really good because together we're stronger. To coin a phrase. Yeah. I mean, I think we must. I think everybody's touched on some very interesting points, but uh, I would uh, counsel everyone to bear in mind uh, intersectionality because it's a very real thing. So if you do have a disability. It, 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 it's squared if you're a woman and then squared again um, if, if, if you're, if you're a, a, a non-white female with a disability. So um, I think we always need to bear those intersectionalities in, in mind and I hope that we're all improving at that. There's a, some interesting questions. Uh, one from Atlin is um, succession planning. How can you build DNI into succession planning so that you know, you're not then uh, being succeeded by somebody who looks just like you. Richard, you touched on the stuff that you're doing with the Ned thing. Do you does DNI come into succession planning in your in your thinking and leads thinking? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's a it's a very hot topic, and I think it goes back to that pipeline piece I mentioned. So, be it at the board level, at kind of the executive team level. We're really thinking about succession. We're you know smallish organisation, so we don't you know it's looking at the different people who could do different roles, and then putting a lens over that around um, all of the characteristics you mentioned, be it gender, ethnicity, but other characteristics too. And we're really trying. And people are, have done a great job of disclosing some of that really quite more sensitive data 
Um, and we are trying to get more and more of that disclosure there to help us to do that even better. Um, because to your point about both intersectionality, but things like, things like social mobility, you know, we're really keen to look at all the dimensions as we have those conversations. Esther, do you do do you think that um, succession planning is is done well with the DNI lens? And I think where you can make a good connection is if you've been very broad in recruitment of you know roles, and you've got diverse shortlists like Richard said, you still put the best person in the job, but you are likely to have more multiple diverse candidates. And what we very actively do is maintain then you know contact with people who might not have got the job but then grow them to make sure that the next time they're there so coach them mentor them you know any other support be it formal education etc so um you can quite easily you know the work you put in to create that diverse list of candidates and then build from them ali I agree. All of the above. I, I would just, I mean, absolutely to endorse, particularly around that. It's all about the pipeline. If you haven't got the pipeline, you can't have obviously great representation. So we've got to focus on that pipeline. Okay. Um, so um, that's I, 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 that's rattled through very quickly. Sadly, we're out of time. And so there are there were questions about being overwhelmed with uh, DNI and how do you cope? But I think we'll try and answer those questions. Uh, individually. Uh, one astonishingly um, thoughtful and inspiring panel you are. Uh, and I sort of feel as chair of DIFF, we're going in the right direction. There's a lot of stuff still to do. Um, and I would say, you know, people like Dina are supported by the fact that DIFF has a bursary which supports smaller businesses, uh, which is supported by, uh, uh, through Ali, l &G, and and Esther at Lloyds Banking Group and Santander and Simply Biz. So, you know, we, we welcome smaller uh, companies to to become members of DIFF. Uh, and, you know, we want to find more Dina Buddhias because we need to give people like Dina a voice because we are all improved by listening to what she has to say. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, and I look forward to speaking to you all again. Uh, and I'm sure you all owe me lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.